This video is brought to you by Wondershare Filmora 10. What's up, Wisecrack? Michael here, and today we're diving into a topic that people are totally reasonable and level-headed about. One that we can all see eye to eye on and talk out our differences without resorting to name calling. No, 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 I'm just kidding. We're comparing the MCU to the DCEU. And we're not here to tell people whether or not Justice League is better or worse than Infinity War or Endgame. Instead, we're here to figure out what the differences between the Marvel and DC films mean. So join us for this Wisecrack edition on the DCEU versus the MCU. And spoilers ahead for, well, you know what, just, just roll the list. But before we continue, I want to give a quick shout out to this week's sponsor, Wondershare Filmora 10. Creating YouTube videos can be really fun and rewarding, but if you're not extremely tech savvy, the various video editing softwares can be daunting. Wondershare Filmora 10 is extremely user friendly and even has a YouTube channel with tutorials so you can learn to edit with ease. It includes preset templates for effects, filters, and transitions. Wondershare Filmora 10 even has color matching and audio ducking. Audio is one of the most important and underrated parts of video editing. Editing. So it's great that you can just select keyframes to make sure that your videos have a good sound mix without having to become a professional audio engineer. Click the link in the description if you want to get started for free. The videos will have a watermark, but you can try out all the great features Wondershare has to offer. If you tweeted us what you think using the hashtag CreateWithFilmora, then you could even win a free license. So check it out. Now, back to the show. We're going to be talking in broad strokes here, so there will be some notable exceptions, but let's establish what we think is a key difference between the two universes. Namely, the DCEU is full of warriors and the MCU is full of magicians. I don't have time for your magic tricks. Illusions, Dad. You don't have time for my illusions. What is Not literally, but hear me out. We're going to need to take a quick crash course on narrative theory, particularly the work of author Carol Pearson. In her book, The Hero Within, Pearson theorizes that any fictional hero can be grouped into one of six basic categories or archetypes which build upon one another. Those are the innocent, the orphan, the wanderer, the warrior, the martyr, and the magician. Importantly, a hero's archetype can primarily be determined by the lesson they must learn on their journey. As Pearson writes, the innocent lives in the pre-fallen state of grace. The orphan confronts the reality of the fall. The wanderer begins the task of finding oneself apart from others. The warrior learns to fight to defend oneself and to change the world in one's own image. And the martyr learns to give, to commit, and to sacrifice for others. And the magician, well, the magician is the hero who learns to truly understand themselves and their place in the universe. Key to all of this, Pearson believes, is the fact that heroes often progress through multiple multiple archetypes sequentially on their journeys as they become more rounded, better beings. A character that starts out as an innocent may turn into an orphan, then a wanderer, and end up as a warrior, or then a martyr, or even a magician, usually but not always in a linear progression. But what does any of this have to do with superheroes? Well, Pearson's model not only accurately describes the vast majority of on-screen superhero narratives, but it also highlights the main difference between DC and Marvel films. See, while the DCEU focuses primarily on heroes that fit the first half of the journey from innocent to warrior, the MCU has staked its claim on the latter half of the journey, from warrior to magician. To see what I mean, let's take a quick look at the film that launched the DCEU, Zack Snyder's Man of Steel. Snyder is quick to establish Superman as the archetypal innocent. I mean, he's literally a baby. And not just any baby, but the first natural born child on Krypton in centuries and the literal hope of his entire civilization. But sensing an impending planetary catastrophe, his parents ship him off to Earth, a place known for having zero impending planetary catastrophes. Anyway, from here Superman must move into the orphan phase, where he experiences what Pearson would call a fall from grace. To that end, the orphan must learn two important lessons. One, that the world isn't the great place they once thought it was, and two, that it's not their fault that the world sucks. Early on, we see a young Clark Kent struggle to control his powers while growing up in Kansas. Whether it's him dealing with super hearing-induced panic attacks or being labeled as a literal gift from God. He saw what Clark did. I know he did, I'm sure. I'm sure what he thought he saw was... was an act of God, Jonathan. But despite all these challenges, Clark, with the help of a loving mom and dad, must accept the fact that he didn't do anything wrong to deserve these hardships. Quite the opposite. All these things are happening to him because a greater destiny awaits him, but only when he's ready. Now, on one very literal level, Clark Kent wanders the world. 
first moonlighting as a fisherman and then as a barman. But on a more symbolic level, we see this archetype represented in Clark's crisis of identity. As is usual for the Wanderer, Clark is struggling to find out who he is and how to use his powers. Should he be the man who saves people from a burning oil rig, or the guy who skewers an 18-wheeler out of petty revenge? These questions fall away, though, once he discovers the Kryptonian spaceship. Clark learns that he was meant to guide the people of Earth. The people of Earth are different from us, it's true. But ultimately, I believe that's a good thing. They won't necessarily make the same mistakes we did. Not if you guide them, Cal. In other words, our hero's wanderings have come to an end. He's not only introduced to someone he will want to defend, i.e. Lois Lane, but he's also introduced to his trademark suit. Oh, and also, we learn that symbol is not an S. The symbol of the House of L means hope. In assuming the mantle of Superman, Clark Kent then becomes the most well-known of the hero archetypes, the warrior. According to Pearson, the warriors learn to trust their own truths and act on them with absolute conviction in the face of danger. To do so, moreover, it is necessary for them to take control of and responsibility for their own lives. And we see this behavior in Superman, who finally stops hiding himself from the world and takes a stand against Zod to defend Lois. But here's the thing. Superman only really exists as a warrior. He never progresses to Pearson's other archetypes, like the martyr or the magician. And while he does technically give his life while fighting Doomsday, it was more of a happening to die while defending my girlfriend thing and less of a willfully giving my life for the sake of others thing. And by the next movie, he gets resurrected and immediately gets back to doing warrior stuff. Unlike, say, Tony Stark, who's dead dead after carrying out the snap heard round upstate New York. But Superman isn't the only DCEU hero to fit the warrior archetype. Consider Zack Snyder's Justice League, where we're introduced to Cyborg and Flash, both of whom hew closely to the journey we just outlined. Cyborg, for example, starts off as Victor Stone, a regular high school student, i.e. an innocent. That is, until a car crash kills his mother and his dad turns him into a cybernetic Frankenstein's monster. This moves us to the orphan phase, where Victor harbors some seriously deep-seated rage against his dad, his situation, and the world at large. Left to his own devices, Victor then enters the Wanderer phase. Like Superman before him, Victor begins to test the boundaries of his powers, as well as his own morals, notably by hacking a bank to help a struggling single mother. He also tentatively teams up with the Justice League. And just like the Man of Steel, the Snyder Cut ends with Victor fully accepting and asserting his superpowers. I'm not broken. He has, in short, become a warrior. Now, I know what you might be saying. This journey is ubiquitous to the superhero genre and especially origin stories, but there are some important choices Snyder makes here and we can understand them by figuring out what Marvel does differently. What's different about the MCU is that their heroes rarely stay in the warrior archetype for long. For example, take Doctor Strange. In it, we see the now tried and true progression from innocent to warrior. Doctor Stephen Strange starts the film as an acclaimed neurosurgeon, i.e. an innocent, until yet another car crash gets in the way, i.e. orphan, sending Strange on a journey to repair his hands and study magic, a comertage, ergo Wanderer. But as the Doctor transitions from Wanderer to Warrior, the film begins to differentiate itself from its DCEU peers. After being gravely injured in battle, Strange must reckon with the fact that strength alone won't be enough to save the day. There is no other way. You lack imagination. He must be more than simply a warrior, an archetype obsessed with binaries like strong and weak and winning and losing. Instead, he must become a magician. According to Pearson, the magician gains their power from the realization that they are not the center of the universe, and as such, can't solve all the world's problems. She writes, Magicians discover that, at a deeper level, force does not work. That if they are not flowing with the universe, but rather are struggling against it, no amount of perseverance, skill, courage, or wit will help them get what they want. And Doctor Strange's finale trades in an epic battle for some careful dialogue. As the Dark Dimension engulfs the planet, Strange bargains with the big bad Dormammu, who isn't interested in a deal, that is, until he realizes that Strange has trapped them both in a time loop. And the only way out is through a mutual agreement. And your assault on my world. Never come back. Do it, and I'll break the loop. In the end, Strange saves the day not through physical strength, but by talking it out. And Strange isn't the only character to become a martyr or magician in the MCU. For example, take the Marvel Universe's Uncle Jesse, Tony Stark. 
While he might have started as an innocent, albeit a billionaire, arms-dealing, playboy kind of innocent, he eventually assumes the mantle of Iron Man and becomes a warrior. But something changes after the first Avengers film in which the once selfish Tony nearly sacrifices himself in order to save New York City. In doing so, Tony enters kicking and screaming into the martyr phase of his journey. Now, you don't have to go on a suicide mission to become a martyr. Rather, they're more like the wise old man who gives of themselves freely. And we see Tony begin to give back in ways that would seem at odds with who he used to be. For example, he begins mentoring a young Spider-Man, not only offering him a high-tech suit. I can keep the suit? Yes, yeah, what we were just talking about. But also offering him wisdom and tough love, sort of like Uncle Jesse. Moreover, understanding Tony as the martyr explains why the ending of Infinity War is such a gut punch. I don't feel so good. As Thanos snaps and Peter Parker fades away, we know in our hearts that Tony would have given anything for their roles to have been reversed. But Tony doesn't remain the martyr forever, as we see in Endgame. Sure, he starts the film still very much in that role, now a loving parent who's just happy that he and his family were spared. I got my second chance right here, Cap. Can't roll the dice on it. But just as Doctor Strange before him, Tony learns that he isn't the center of the universe. While he initially doesn't want to do superhero stuff anymore, he must learn to put his own happiness aside for the greater good. But he must also come to recognize his place in that universe. When all hope seems lost in the fight against Thanos, it's telling that Doctor Strange, a magician himself, looks to Tony and gestures, one. This is a callback to Infinity War, in which Strange says that there is only one scenario in which they defeat Thanos. How many did you see? 14,605. How many did we win? One. Realizing that they are in that one reality, Tony accepts the role he must play. I am inevitable. And I am Iron Man. In doing so, he saves the day, but loses his life. But this isn't the sacrifice of Pearson's martyr, but rather the man who has embraced his destiny. He has become, in Pearson's term, the magician archetype. Now, an argument could be made that because the DCEU is a younger franchise, they need to use their films to establish origin stories for their heroes, following them from innocents to warriors and maybe setting them up to one day become magicians. This differs from the MCU, which has already had plenty of time to develop characters like Cap and Iron Man over multi-film arcs. But we're not totally sold on this line of reason. For one, Superman has been in three films across the DCEU and is yet to take on the role of martyr or magician. Similarly, the Batman we're introduced to in the DCEU is an established hero and warrior who has shown little growth out of this archetype. Meanwhile, the MCU has characters like Doctor Strange, whose origin story wraps up with Strange becoming a magician. We think the difference in narrative archetypes between the DCEU and the MCU lies in something more fundamental reality, or at the very least, each cinematic universe's relationship to it. On the most basic level, the DCEU, and more specifically the Snyderverse, doesn't try to sell us on the idea that superheroes could really exist. For one, consider the over-the-top visual style of the DCEU. And we're not just talking about all the breathtaking slow-mo sequences, of which there are plenty. We're also talking about the exaggerated color palette and the hyper-stylized set design. More than anything, though, what these stylistic choices are hinting at is that the DCEU is a symbolic representation of reality. We are watching larger-than-life figures, gods amongst men, as it were, duking it out in epic battles of good versus evil. And the DCEU seems to readily acknowledge this fact, often talking about characters as if they were symbols themselves. There are six, not five. There's no us without him. In sharp contrast, most of the films in the MCU are grounded in our everyday reality. Sure, Wanda will create her own reality, but she's not above hopping in a Buick after witnessing the corpse of her dead lover. Even grander conflicts sometimes revolve around very real-world issues. The whole Captain America-Iron Man split began over questions about whether the UN or any governmental body should regulate the Avengers and their use of force. And while similar themes might pop up from time to time in the DCEU, they're ultimately just precursors. Sure, Superman might get hauled to Congress to testify about the use of his unlimited power, a moment that spurs Bruce Wayne into action, but these kinds of questions are completely dropped by the time Justice League rolls around. 
In the MCU, even when we have a literal god of thunder, we see him down and out with a beer belly and a Fortnite problem. That kid on the TV just called me a dickhead again. Noob master. Whether it's the Avengers hunkering down for a post-battle shawarma or Sam asking for a bank loan, the MCU constantly lulls us into believing that our heroes aren't really that different from us. But how does this explain why the DCEU seems to be so preoccupied with telling stories about warriors, while the MCU is more interested in stories about martyrs and magicians? Well, it all comes down to the importance each cinematic universe places on symbols. According to anthropologist Ernest Becker, symbols are how we cope with the inevitability of our own death. As he notes in his book, The Denial of Death, man is literally split in two. He has an awareness of his own splendid uniqueness in that he sticks out of nature with a towering majesty, and yet he goes back into the ground a few feet in order blindly and dumbly to rot and disappear forever. But since we can't overcome our own impending deaths, we feel compelled to conquer it, at least symbolically. To Becker, this is heroism, the desire to make something of your life, be remembered, and in the process, reach a sort of symbolic immortality. Building off this philosophy, it's not surprising that the DCEU would venerate the warrior archetype, in large part because this archetype, as Pearson notes, amounts to a rejection of death. The warrior goes forth, slays the dragon, and returns with the life-saving elixir. And whether it's the Epic of Gilgamesh or Die Hard, we see this archetype return over and over again because we, as human beings, want to be reassured that we too can conquer death. And taken in this context, the DCEU's highly stylized, symbol-laden world begins to make a lot more sense. We watch these larger-than-life heroes embody our literal hopes and dreams while fighting back the embodiments of certain doom. In contrast, Marvel chooses a situated cinematic universe in our own reality. Now, we're not going to say that the MCU is light on symbols because that's simply not true. But because Marvel is more interested in telling stories that are couched in real life, we see archetypes that focus on accepting, not rejecting, death. In fact, one of the biggest lessons the martyr will learn to embrace is their mortality. Sure, Captain America might help save the day, but what happens after? He gives up the superhero identity that has dominated his whole life in order to live out the rest of his days with his long-lost love, Peggy Carter. And this moment resonates with us on a very different level than comparable ones of the DCEU, precisely because Steve Rogers chose to live a quiet, normal life with the one he loves, very much like any of us would do. He's old, he's frail, and he's entirely human, and it gets you right in the feelings. In contrast, it's pretty much impossible to picture any hero from the DCEU hanging up their costumes for a life of domestic bliss or getting day drunk playing video games with their friends. But what do you think, Wisecrack? Do you think given time the DCEU will reach past the warrior archetype? Or does the Snyder Cut's bleak epilogue imply that the acceptance of death is going to be far away? Let us know in the comments. Big thanks to our patrons for all your support. Hit that subscribe button like you're Stephen Strange driving on a winding road at night, and don't forget to ring that bell. And as always, thanks for watching. Later.